Thank you everybody for coming. And um, every year uh, the graduate faculty of Philosophy Journal puts on a round table. And this year uh, we're very pleased to bring uh, Bettina Burgo here. Uh, she has a very interesting long essay <laughs> that is a part of our last issue that is right there. Um, and that's sort of going to be the basis of her talk uh, today. We have uh, a reception after the talk that you should please stick around for. Uh, we also have like a display of past journal issues, including um, our most recent, which we is part. So I'm going to turn things over to Simon now, who asked me to introduce him briefly. Um, I take it that you all know him. Uh, he's the Hans Jonas professor here. Um, I'll just mention his one of his most recent and I'll say most beautifully written books, which is The Problem of Levinas. <laughs> I say it's yes. Uh, so I'm just sneaking that in there. And because you wrote else. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so for anything else, just like check his Wikipedia page or something. Yeah. He's got a lot, so I'll yeah. turn it over to Simon. Yeah, so Alexis is my ghost writer. <laughs> on most things now, uh, as will become clear. No, so, yeah, and the Graduate Faculty Philosophy Journal, we have to support the journal and make sure it exists long into the future. And Alexis does absolutely sterling and brilliant work, as do the other people that work for the journal, and um, long may it continue. It's a precious, precious thing, is it not? Precious thing. Let's take it for the journal. And um, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Bettina Berger, who I first met in 1990. When she was this big, <laughs> in 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 the in the Collegium Phenomenologicum, which is a kind of sick, perverted Heideggerian church that meets in Italy every every year. And uh, we survived that because on that that year they were doing Levinas. That's right. They were doing Levinas for the first time, pretty much. Well, the Levinas had been at the first Collegium, hadn't he, in 1976. And so, and we, we both uh, were reading Levinas, and in particular, otherwise than being, and in particular, the question was the question of the transition between Levinas's perception of ethics and politics. That was really what That's was right. in the air. And you were trying to figure that out. I was trying to figure that out. And we both tried to figure that out in different ways, and it's, <laughs> And here we are, having figured that out, and have great wisdom to pass on to you. Um, we just can't remember what it is, but it's it's a great importance. And uh, Bettina teaches at Université de Montréal, uh, Université Francophone, Montréal, uh, and it's um, a great place with as big a graduate community as, as this place. And uh, it's a fine department, and uh, this year she's at the Martin Mary Center in the University of Chicago. And the paper is, as it says, it's um, uh, in the latest issue of the Graduate Faculty Philosophy Journal. And to my right is Professor James Dodd, who will be familiar to all of you. And he was teaching us all the logical investigations this year, right? Year long seminar. And, um, and James has a response which we've looked at, and it's fascinating, and we're going to have an interesting debate. Um, so without further ado, Bettina. It's really it's a privilege to be here and I thank everyone. Firstly, Alexis Dianda for making this possible. Simon for not speaking about how badly we all played volleyball. And thank you James for uh, reading through a 50 page paper. So thanks to the journal also. Um, sorry about the technical things. There's a joke about two rabbis, which I'm going to set between two cardinals because it reminds me, and I recommend it, of Lenny Bruce speaking about Cardinal Spellman and Sheehan meeting Moses and Jesus. There's a moment where he says, yes, of course they're white. <laughs> there. <laughs> so we have then the first cardinal, head bowed, walks toward the altar, toward the cross where he proclaims, O oh, suffering path of the cross. Before this, I am nothing. The second cardinal, his colleague, crosses around the back and never taking his eyes off the altar, murmurs in the direction of the cross, O oh, life of our savior, that I could imitate this life, but I am but dust and ashes. 
I solemnly prepare to leave, backing up, once at the door. I see a little fellow, janitor it seems, kneel down before the altar saying, ah, sinner that I am, an eternal cipher. One cardinal looks at the other and says, now look who says he's nothing. <laughs> well, this joke could be told by phenomenologists with letting us occasionally playing the part of janitor. But janitor or not, his intuitions into intersubjectivity, passions, and traumatic affects have haunted since his death a great deal of French phenomenology, notably at the Husserl Archives in Paris. In many places, Levinas will say things like, our presentation of notions remains faithful to intentional analysis, insofar as it signifies locating notions in the horizon of their appearing, a horizon unrecognized or displaced, in the exhibition of an object. Or again, in responding to Theo de Boer in 1975, um, it is not the word transcendental that I would keep, but the notion of intentional analysis. I think that in spite of everything, what I do is phenomenology, even if all of Husserl's methodology is not perspective. This isn't fanciful. It's not Husserl, no kowtowing to an interlocutor or brandishing Husserlian party papers to counter the Heideggerians. So why is Levinas' so-called exteriority, for example, why is the face that he describes as pre-intentional resistant to constitution because not directly perceived, why is all this dismissed as smoke and mirrors? That's a quote. Or surreptitious God talk. As though Levinas were not Jewish. As though a Jewish thinker would today try to sneak God into incarnation. It's been done. But Levinas is a rationalist, a mitmatist. So what's the point of the article? Basically to show this. That Levinas, as a critical reader of Husserl, worked phenomenologically by exploiting four ambiguities in Husserl's thought. These ambiguities are as follows, and they structure my presentation. First. Husserl's evolving conception of Einfühlung, alternately translated as entropathy or empathy, better perhaps might actually just be in feeling. Second, Husserl's critical dis distinction between perception and apperception, where apperception denotes what is co-given horizontally with perception, or what you see and retain even though you don't know or you're not paying attention to it at a given time. Third, Husserl's conception of pre-objective time as the temporizing flow of consciousness with at least its three aspects or ecstasies, its three stretchings, retention, protention, and the standing stream of present. Finally, he exploits Levinas, uh, Husserl's 1918 to 1927 research into passive synthesis, and notably into spontaneous association, memory, and affective forces. No need to add, here's the full list, that Husserl's towering thought evolved, notably on points one and four, and James Dodd can teach us a lot about point three. Didier Franck once referred to the communication of phenomenology as a dramatique des phénomènes, a dramatic exemplification which is meant to enhance phenomenological intelligibility, or as Hegel once said, meant to avoid the impatience of the concept when a concept is prematurely detached from what is concrete. This paradigmatic method, as Levinas calls it, is also found in Talmudic reflection. So let me offer two micro-paradigms, the first from Hegel, the second will be Husserl's rethinking of Hegel. First then, from the 1807 Phenomenology, section 174. Hegel writes, the simple I is this genus for which the differences are not differences only by its or the I's being the negative essence of shaped independent moments. And self-consciousness is thus certain of itself only by superseding this other that presents itself to self-consciousness as an independent life. Self-consciousness is desire. Certain of the nothingness of this other consciousness, it explicitly affirms that this nothingness is for it, the truth of that other, you're nothing. It destroys the independent object and thereby gives itself the certainty of itself as a true certainty 
a certainty which has become explicit for self-consciousness itself in an objective manner. Here's the quote. I realize we can't just exert things from Hegel's phenomenology or the dialectic of two self-consciousnesses. It doesn't begin or end there. After all, this is the path to spirit, toward the I that is a we, and toward intersubjective formations like the state. But note here that the evolving self-consciousness negates. It desires, consumes, subjugates things and beings, which thereby gives it the certainty of itself as a true certainty. Up to now, it's self-certainty largely in itself, but not for itself. So Hegel adds, five sections later, self-consciousness is faced by another self-consciousness. It has come out of itself. This has a twofold significance. First, it's lost itself, for it finds itself as another being. And second, in so doing, it has superseded the other. <clears throat> where it does not see the other as an essential being, but in the other sees its own self. Still not yet a self-consciousness in and for itself, it will be through the resistance of the other that self-consciousness A ceases to see in self-consciousness B um, its own self and recognizes it and hopefully gets it to serve A. There's a lot to say about these passages, but note that what drives the simple eyes quest, again, is desire, the gilda, and you might say will. Indeed, desire defines self-consciousness. It is its life and its efficiency, its effectivity. So let's pass now to the second drum from Husserl's 1927 notes entitled The Phenomenological Reduction to the Alter Ego and to Intersubjectivity. 1927 is rather late, Husserl, written at a time when he was also exploring his famous double reduction. He writes, I have the experience of the others as my fellows, and adds, guided by the expression of the foreign subjectivity and its fleshly corporeity that appears to me, I posit precisely the existence of this foreign subjectivity. Although the foreign subjectivity is increasingly unified with mine, its basic strangeness is never lost. But intersubjective contact opens onto action, and this implies that my will is consciously at the same time in the will of the other person, and vice versa. This is particularly clear, he says, in the example of the establishment of a master-servant relationship. Because at the transcendental level, my will becomes one with that of the other. In these two primal scenes, paradigmatic scenes, if you prefer, you can see differences, though both logics are guided by this possibility of spirit emerging, that I that is also a we. Absent in Husserl is Hegel's dualism of Ansich and Fürsich, as well as Hegel's dynamic Begierde. Husserl starts from my fellows, right? my mitmenschen. And as absent as desire seems to be, patent is the practical passage of willing between these two figures. My will becomes one with that of the other. This carrying over of wills occurs thanks to communication, as well as to Einfühlung and pairing, album, which by 1927 are a spontaneous passive association that belongs to what Husserl calls my inner sphere. Nevertheless, there remains an evolving limit on how integrally I can constitute the foreign consciousness. Please note that the English term, term empathy does not capture how passive and comprehensive Husserl's Einfühlung is in 1927. By 1932, five years later, Husserl will add that, quote, when we understand each other in a unilateral way or in a reciprocal mode, according to empathic experience, then this amounts, if empathy becomes an intuitive apresentation, to producing a covering between me and the other. And this covering is something entirely new. The limit placed on constituting the other, the absolute quality of the other consciousness that Husserl once embraced 
is, as if questioned in 1932, set afloat in this covering of two, even if it's only covering of our two bodies. This is, again, the working of empathy, not desire, not the Hegelian negative. So here, I should make a contextual remark. Husserl's approach to Einfühlung easily spans two decades. It begins with his confrontation with the Munich phenomenologist Theodor Lips, 1851 to 1914, for whom, for Lips, empathy arose out of two basic human instincts, the drive of life to externalize itself and the mimetic drive. For Lips, empathy takes place actively and cognitively when I perceive another's expression imagine myself making that expression and then transfer what I feel, making the expression, back onto the other person. Husserl was familiar with the Munich School, which he initially considered psychologistic uh, rather than truly phenomenal logic. As early as 1913, Husserl expressed doubts about how far we can really access the other's affects and imminent states through empathic constitution. That is, how we can perform an analogical constitution of the other's state of mind when we do not even see our own externalizations, our own expressions, our own oisobongen. Worse, Lips's theory of empathy argued that we could feel our egoic subject in a foreign body. But that supposed that Lips already understood what the ego was and how it developed. But Lips, <clears throat> Yeah, but Lips could say nothing about constituting the layers and a priori laws of the ego's development. So Lips's egoic subjectivity had not really moved past empirical psychology. So much for Husserl's 1913 reticence about empathy. Levinasian might also note the important limit he's setting Husserl on constituting the other. A year later, in notes from 1914, Husserl argued that Einfühlung, as he understood it, belonged above all to apperception, or indirect perception, which Levinas will praise as Husserl's discovery of horizons. Apperceptively, the affects and states of mind of the other are indirectly co-given with my perception of their moving, moving body. But already, Husserl had moved a little closer to lips, asking, what lies in the way in which the external appearance functions apperceptively? I'm referring to my here, to which the external appearing of my body is referred, as well as to the inner appearance that accompanies it, into which the external appearance must be translated. This internal appearance is the analogon, the analog, of that inner appearance which would result if I set my body over there, where the other stands. And likewise, my external bodily appearance, which would go from here over to there, is analogous to the external appearance that I have of that body. Complicated. Co-given, then, with the appearance of the other person over there, who shares the space around my moving body, is something of their internal appearance, presumably some state of mind. But what lies therein, asks Husserl, outside of my kinesthetic body and its feelings? And how do I grasp in the external appearing of the other person what their states of mind might actually be, or that they might be analogous to mine? By 1914, we see Husserl's growing rapprochement with lips, which is part of a long and fascinating journey. This rapprochement follows the, the unfolding of Husserl's genetic phenomenology and his extensive notes on intersubjectivity taken between 1905 and 1935. Now in 1908, the other had been qualified as being absolute. I posit that other, Husserl wrote, as an absolute being. You can see that initially the defining limit that Levinas sets on constituting another person phenomenologically is also found in Husserl, albeit for different reasons. I think for Husserl, it's eidetic integrity. For Husserl, what I invariably see is a body over there and various behaviors. In 1961, Levinas speaks in terms of the ungraspable expression of the other. Quote, the face does not manifest itself by qualities, 
But kaf auto, it expresses itself. The notion of the face thus opens other perspectives, brings us to a notion of meaning prior to meaning the story. So much for Levinas, whose perplexing concept of exteriority could be seen as a strict limit on the constitution of the other, at least initially before intentionality gives us what we call what he calls the third party. But between 1921 and 1928, Husserl's notes on intersubjectivity presented new constitutions of interpersonal encounters, calling them on two occasions the I and thou. Incidentally, Huber's book comes out midway in 1923. Something like Levinas's phenomenology of expression would henceforth depend for Husserl both on apperception and the operation of Einfühlung and pairing. Yet working at the eidetic level implied that Husserl described fully the original sphere of the ego, in which this Einfühlung now unfolded passive. Within this original sphere, we find the transcendental consciousness, a flowing pre-objective temporalizing it invariably features nomos, a larger sphere of the living present that contains all that flows back from the now moments, even as it anticipates what is immediately to come. And the original sphere contains recollections and fantasy. By the 1920s, I repeat, empathy was expressly part of the original sphere. Let me briefly turn to this complex temporalizing that belongs to and characterizes the original sphere. The work on what Husserl called absolute subjectivity was underway from 1905, only to be vastly enriched in 1917 by the Bernau manuscripts on which James Dodd has written beautifully. Let me just add of transcendental subjectivity that the flow just mentioned streams as much as it stands. That is, the living present is always dynamically there even as it presumably flows all the way back to my earliest experience. Later, Husserl will say that the ego streams along with the flow of consciousness. The ego lives in all experienced states of consciousness. There is, as you can see, an uninterrupted, what Lenny Nance would call a totalizing quality to absolute subjectivity, though not clearly to Lipsa's psychologistic subjectivity. And this totalizing quality will pose Husserl new difficulties, such as how far back does consciousness really flow? Or again, does the flow that is absolute subjectivity stop flowing at a certain point when it reaches a certain degree of pastness? Or again, what is it that preserves certain contents of our attentions while not preserving others? Finally, as Husserl jotted one of his famous afterthoughts called the Beilage to the notes on passive synthesis, quote, the constitution of time cannot be founded on the possibility of awakening re uh, recollection a new infinitum. Something else in intersubjectivity? These questions addressing Husserl's increasingly complex approach to transcendental consciousness understood as temporization as positionally stable and dynamic. These were all important to the later Levinas of otherwise than being. By exploiting ambiguities in Husserl's discussion of what moved the flow sensation, Levinas would argue that Husserl's was perhaps not the only basic structure of time consciousness, and that the traumatizing aspect or impact of being under the gaze of the other, of being singled out, flows back also sediments, but recurs as memories that have the amorphous form of trouble and affect. In 1974, Levinas called these recurrences obsession, persecution, and substitution. Affectivity, understood broadly as anything that ultimately attracts the attention of the ego, <coughs> this affectivity might not enter neatly into the standing streaming of Husserl's pre-objective temporalizing consciousness. To get to his argument, however, Levinas had to plumb the ambiguities arising in Husserl's work on passive synthesis. Notably, I think, what made association, whether by fusion or by contrast, possible. And along with association, memory, and the affective forces in our retentions themselves. Let me pause for a moment and address an ambiguity which I think Levinas was aware of since he wrote about it in 1965 in an essay called Intentionality and Sensation. 
I don't know how much Levinas knew of, his, of Husserl's significant 1917 rethinking of the 1905 time consciousness lectures. I don't know if Levinas met Edith Stein and discussed her concept of empathy when he was in Freiburg in 28. I do know that James Dodd has pondered the relationship between Husserl's 1905 time consciousness approach and his revisions in the Bernanke manuscripts. The point is that in 1905, Husserl offered right triangular de depictions of time consciousness to illustrate the vertical sinking down you can see from now moment E down to P prime down to A prime. And then the horizontal passage of sequential now moments with their pretensions and retentions again from E, the now moment, flowing back to A where the protensions are not graphically included. This prompted debates about whether Husserl could really open access after the fact to pure transcendental subjectivity in its immediacy. And as the a priori norm underlying all of our lived experiences consisting of intentional aiming and object donation. A lot of ink has flowed on this debate, which concerns in part the status and accessibility of transcendental imminence and immediacy. But maybe it's enough to say here that what Levinas was interested in above all was the conundrum of sensation with regard to the temporalizing flow, where sensation and flow might be understood as kind of analogous to primitive matter and form. <clears throat> Levinas wondered, I'll put this in the question, in form of a question, one that Husserl also wrestled with, namely, does the material of our sensations, does the materiality that is sensation propel the ongoing transcendental flow as each new now moment, each new sensation wells up and is subtly modified? Or should we admit that the flow of consciousness is what makes sensation possible consciously once it has become an affect that can attract the attention of the ego? See, if the second is the case, if the universal flow, uh, if the universal form of intentionality is primary, then pre or proto consciousness in the form of sensation is unavailable. And a formal dynamic unity becomes primary because it structures sensation, allowing it to enter consciousness at all. But if the first is the case, then sensation, which theoretically fuels the flow, comes both before and after its own structuring as conscious awareness. That is, it comes before because something had to be going on, say, in your body, your nervous system, before uh, I was aware of it. And it comes after because as conscious awareness, uh, it is only as conscious awareness that I experience sensation at all. Conundrum. Following Levinas's 1965 essay, which he concluded simply enough by praising the idealism of Husserl's approach. His 1974 work entitled Otherwise Than Being exploited the ambiguity that James Dodd has phrased this way. Implicit in every lived experience is the living through of that experience as its origin. Again, and in other words, can the implicit be made explicit without denaturing it or forcing it into what reflection believes it to be? With regard to sensation welling up into consciousness, how do you approach chaotic, amorphous sensations and affects? In otherwise than being, Levinas contests the ultimacy of an uninterrupted living through as a totalizing transcendental consciousness and the sole origin of experience. Moreover, despite his protesting to Theo de Boer about Husserl's recourse to a certain transcendental itself debated by people like John Zaha and, uh, Dan Zahavi and John Brown. Anyhow, despite his protesting, Levinas also seeks a pre-reflective co-temporalizing that would be specific to certain as affects, and perhaps even to speak like Husserl in the passive syntheses, shot through with affective forces. Levinas is also aware that retention, those interconnected now moments that have flowed or stretched back and continue to sink, sediment, is aware that retention, quote, is only what it is thanks to an as yet unspecified relation to protension or spontaneous anticipation. 
This is how Dodd put it in 2005, preparing discussion of the innovations of the Bernal manuscripts. I like it because it emphasizes, among other things, Husserl's restless, ongoing exploration of the transcendental level and his original sphere. It points also to an ambiguity that I think Levinas may have known, namely the continuing activity of anticipation, protension, even as given now moments have flowed back, functionally vanishing from view. These two modes of temporalizing consciousness, retention and protention, prove to be interwoven and account for the complexity of consciousness as the precondition of objective time. Protension, active here and now, but also ongoingly as the flow continues, points to a Vollbewusstsein, to a pre-consciousness. Paraphrasing Dodd. But this pre-consciousness may have little to no content. As anticipation, it might be closer to a feeling. For this suggests something about the recurrence of some affects, whether as memories that hardly come together in our consciousness or in the wake of an encounter with another. Levinas may have had such a thing in mind when he spoke in uh, 1974 of persecution and recurrence. For now, let me just pay homage to James Dodd's article on time consciousness, which is much more complex than I've indicated. Although the ambiguities posed by sensation and the interweave of retentions and protentions, not to mention associations passively coming up in us, right? Interested Levinas on a hermeneutic level a level that Husserl did not exclude, for reasons I explain in the article. In short, Husserl's interest in sensibility, understood as affects and value, long paralleled a concern with object constituting sensation. So sensation and sensibility, if you will, sensation and emotion, if you like, were isomorphic for Husserl. By extension, the grounds of his ethics were rationalist, even intellectualist and originally framed on the cognitive approach we find in uh, the logical investigation. In short, Husserl's concern with ethics did not really consider Einfühlung, much less hermeneutics, and Levinas's approach to intersubjective affects would not have seen a viable ground for an ethics to Husserl. Okay, thank you. I've tried to set forth in broad strokes aspects of Husserl's approach to time consciousness, so-called, his approach to transcendental subjectivity, and in passing, acknowledge my debt to James Dawn. However, because the 1917 Bernal manuscripts on time consciousness and individuation so complexify this picture, I can't spend more time on it here. I wish I knew whether Levinas was familiar with them, even by the story of Edith Stein's great disappointment when she arrived in Bernal expecting to work with Husserl on the revision of his 1905 time consciousness lectures, and then had to leave when Husserl essentially vanished into his study to write them. The picture of what transcendental consciousness is would never be the same, actually. What I can say is that Levinas was familiar with Husserl's early work on sensation and time consciousness, as well as his notes on passive synthesis. Remember our earlier scene. In my initial sketch of Husserl's 1927 encounter between two time consciousnesses, it is through Einfühl, empathy or entropathy, that two wills penetrate each other, and thanks to this I come to know the other increasingly well, despite their foreignness. The 1927 notes belong to Husserl's late conception of empathy as pure spontaneity, arising as apperception and preconsciously given with any perception. Einfühlung belongs to my original sphere, as I said, because when I perform an egological reduction, I find the other already there in my reduced consciousness, or my monad, as he came to say. Mm -hmm. Husserl even deliberated, uh, deliberated about whether a monad might not have windows causally opened by others. However, although Einfühlung is not tied to passive synthesis in the definitive Ideas I, published in 1911, it does come to be tied closely to passivity when Husserl presented his mature philosophy in the 1928 Cartesian Meditations. In those lectures, he argued that in a face-to-face -face situation, the spontaneity of apperception entails a carrying over, an übertragung, from my lived body to the other. This carrying over was primordial 
and it certainly corrected Lips as cognitive empathy and his two mythical dramas. Through carrying over our two bodies coincide. And I think this coinciding parallels the first degree of association through, through resemblance, which he develops in the notes on passive synthesis. That is, associations of resembling objects facilitate identification and later concept formation. But these associations also imply reproductive memory, which is tied to the interactions between retentions and protentions and transmittive consciousness. At a deep level, Husserl ventured around 1918 that, quote, the phenomenology of association is a higher extension of the doctrine of the originary constitution of time. So what comes first? The fact of spontaneous passive association, knitting our experiences together, or the transcendental consciousness that flows and is always there standing on the stream, which has priority. It seems hard to decide. But to return to the Übertragung, the coinciding of our two bodies occurs thanks to a spontaneous association, effected passively through the merging of recollection and perception. The same applies to apperception, and this too can be scrutinized phenomenologically. Thus, association has an encompassing, even an assimilative quality, despite the fact that in the case of the other person, the dimension of foreignness remains. Indeed, as I grasp the others, that the other's body is like mine, I note that my own, to me, partly visible body, must have the integrity that the others have. It is the perceived unity of the other body that gives me a sense of myself as an empirical being, as this person here. And we can recall Levinas's 1961 arguments that the other is what individuates me, though again for Levinas it's through their singling me out by their gaze rather than through association. For Husserl, in the now of an association through resemblance, there occurs a moment of self-alienation. Beyond questions of empirical self-objectification, self-alienation suggests that in my perception and apperception of the other, I momentarily lose myself or something of myself, recognizing that I'm squarely in the other's field of vision, even though I don't know his thoughts implicitly. All of this comes to pass, the spontaneous carrying over as also the self-alienation at the deep level of my egoic life. As Nathalie de Praz argues, self-alienation or entfremdung, sometimes written with a hyphen entfremdung to underscore the processual, is a structural condition of my relation to the other person. The point was not lost on Levinas, even though he knew the Cartesian meditations as their co-translator, and maybe less well, was Will's notes on intersubjectivity from the 1920s. Important here is the echo we hear in the 1974 Levinas, who introduced his section on, on substitution with the citation you know from Paul Ceylon, I am you when I am I. This seems to me to be a radicalization of self-alienation. With apperception and spontaneous Einfühlung, Postel's phenomenology of intersubjective encounters reaches toward the pure psychology he had already considered in a remarkable work, The Basic Problems of Phenomenology from 1910. Already there, we see that he was interested in more than eidetic constitution. It's important because some readers scarcely tarry with the Husserl who wrote notes on phenomenological psychology and on passive synthesis. But if association plays the role I alluded to in the unification of consciousness as temporalizing, as standing streaming, then the question of how association occurs becomes unavoidable. This opens the question of passive synthesis and affective force, something Levinas took up in his own way. Husserl argued that as our lived now moments flow back as retentions, they undergo a process of cognitive impoverishment, an ongoing intuitive depletion. There's less and less to them. Indeed, depleted of its contents, a retention can actually become devoid of content and its original affective force almost nil, he argued. At this point, in the passive synthesis notes, Husserl makes a strange claim. Empty retentions are not nothing. Empty retentions are zero degrees of awakening, 
they are the source and origin of associations awakened. Comparable, he says, to the arithmetic zeros counted nevertheless among the numbers. Almost anything can be awakened out of empty retentions, if not by us or at will, then by another. By the period 1918 to 1926, this was part of the phenomenological structure of memory itself. It's also why Husserl claimed that the foreign quality of the other can be compared to the alien quality of a memory. It's also why Husserl claimed, beg your pardon, because even empty retentions can occasion the return of a hitherto lost memory, even though the retention is less a memory than the way the present moment stretches back, whether perceived or apperceived, gradually sedimenting in the past whether intuitively full or more and more empty. So if it's the loss of so-called affective force that contributes to the emptying of retentional contents, then affective force plays a role in how will I perceive or remember anything. This is how or how and what, that is how and what something or someone will awaken in me invariably passively. I suspect that for Levinas in 1974, the encounter with the other person was one such moment of great affective intensity. Moreover, if what Levinas calls recurrence, obsession, persecution, if this expresses the spontaneous passive return of affective forces as forces that don't make sense but leave me too tight in my skin, then Levinas is writing something that we already find in Husserl's notes on passive synthesis. The meaningful succession of temporal phases implies ordered objects contributing to a coherent world, to be sure. But beneath or beside these orderly phases are nevertheless two more chaotic levels, the chaos of impressions in the process of self-organizing and the chaos of the connections of our many sense fields amongst themselves. To the degree that he knew of Husserl's investigations into these deep levels of consciousness, to the degree that they might have discussed this two years after the end of the Notes on Passive Synthesis when Levinas was in Freiburg in 28, to that degree otherwise than being can be said to step into the deep level of sensuous chaos where it locates the roots of my affective investiture by another person or indeed, as was also understood, by an alien, seemingly senseless memory. Let me illustrate this and recall that in 1974, Levinas wrote, it's because the assembly of non-signifying elements into a structure and the arrangement of structures into systems or into a totality involves chance and delays and something like bad or good luck since the finitude of being is not only due to the fate that destines the way it carries on toward meaningful manifestation, it's because of this chance and these delays that subjectivity and retention, memory and history intervenes to hasten the elements into a present, to re-present them. The intervention of subjectivity to forge meaning is a passive process for Husserl. But that some dimension of the subject proves able to order these non-signifying elements into a structure. That's already idealism. I presume it's the case in practice, but it doesn't justify our overlooking those affective elements or forces that come to pass in intersubjective encounters and traumatic memories. And that's Levinas's wager. Our pure passive ability to totalize bathes in Husserl's chaos of sensuous fields, and his chaos becomes Levinas's pure susceptibility. To present reflectively, or as a philosophical argument, the chaos of recurrent intensities and the affective opening of a self that responds to another is impossible because it becomes a theme or a hypothesis. Nevertheless, Levinas takes up this challenge, proceeding with his own dramatique des phénomènes, his own paradigmatic method by which he opens an other li and being. This is so-called because the question of being as meaningful thematized existence already assumes the minimal integration or erasure also of affective forces in the chaos of sense fields. The subject arising in the passivity of unconditionality, writes Levinas, in the expulsion outside its being at home with itself is undeclinable. 
In other words, that subject admits no higher modalizations. It can't be refused. But this undeclinability, he adds, is not that of transcendental consciousness. It's not that Levinas rejects Husserl's method. He transforms it into speculation, and it is speculation on the dynamics of intersubjective affects and on the layers of passivities already opened by Husserl. In my article, I try to show how he's taken up Husserl's themes of affective forces, levels of chaos, and the questions posed by Husserl's syntheses of association, whether contrastive or concordant, and leading to fusion. Let me just recall parenthetically that for Husserl, the intensity of affection is firstly a function of contrast, rather than concordance or similarity. So disjunction, creating difficulties in identification, say of another, would flow from affections engendered by contrast. After all, it's there in the movement of affective forces and between the spheres of our awakening and our forgetting that Husserl will say it's a matter of a phenomenology of the unconscious. That is how far Husserl went, not officially, maybe not in the published works, but in his meditations on spontaneous association in radical passivity. It's this influence, I believe, that Levinas unfolded in the suffering of recurrent affective memory, and even the apperceptive disruption of face-to-face -face encounters with other people. So let me come back in closing to Husserl's evolving approach to empathy. For it's with passive synthesis that everything changes for Einfühlen. Much changed as well in Husserl's approach to temporalizing consciousness. In the 1920s, in his notes on intersubjectivity, Husserl thrust Einfühlung and Paarung pairing to their deepest intuitive levels, speaking even of my spontaneous grasp of the other's internal tumult and psychic excitation. It was through his radicalization of empathy and pairing that Husserl not only corrected Theodore Lipps's cognitivism, but dug as if beneath Hegel's dialectic of desiring negating consciousness. That is why Husserl could write sounding a lot like Merleau-Ponty. Instead of a juxtaposition of two consciousnesses ready to deny the in itself of the other, we have to do with an interweave of sociality, which is clearly part of the meaning of the terms of master and servant. The action of the servant is not an isolated, simply private action, but rather an action taken in the awareness of the fulfillment of the voluntary requirements of his master. The order of the master is a will that is projected into the subjectivity of the servant. Where is that quote? That quote is from about 1925. It's all part of the Hegel thing. Yeah. 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 Learn. And so far as the penetration of one will into another is plausible, and I think you can see a number of cases of this in various circumstances. But also, but insofar as Hegel's agonistics are also probative, we have a depth problem. Because Husserl's example, as you probably just sensed, unfolded at the transcendental level, opens a typology, a kind of universality, but it also belies a naivete that Hegel's does not, with the servant dutifully going to fulfill the will. But what if Husserl's paradigmatic sense a uh, paradigmatic story could also be a projection of desire, or even a projection of helplessness, a kind of collapsed will such as we find in the face and the passive resistance of the face of the orphan, the stranger, and the widow, letting us. The point is that Husserl's merging of wills as a phenomenon of Einfühlung and spontaneous association, but eventually also merging of passions, find their extreme translation in Levinas's substitution, which he defined as an intentional transgression, an obsession that goes against intentionality. That this event that goes against intentionality is also maybe firstly found in Husserl. So though he probably didn't know of Husserl's reworking of the master-slave dialectic, Levinas too thought of Hegel when he thought of passivity and the chaos of passions. Levinas wrote, for the venerable tradition to which Hegel refers, for which the ego is equal to itself, and consequently, for which the return of the being to itself is concrete universality, 
when seen starting from the obsession of passivity, of the self anarchical, there emerges an inequality behind the equality of consciousness. This inequality was explored by Husserl as a function of contrastive associations. One example of which was suffering, a wahnsinniger Schmerz, a maddening pain. This constituted but one form of extreme contrast, yielding, enduring affective forces that flowed back and sedimented. But less physically, the seeming equality of consciousness that Levinas denounced in Hegel shows inconsistencies in intersubjective encounters in Husserl as well. As Husserl argues in 1928, two data are given in the unity of consciousness according to an intuitive distinction and on the basis of which, in pure passivity, a ground phenomenologically a unity of resemblance as distinct appearances. Fine. However, finer analysis shows that there is here in an essential manner an intentional transgression that intervenes genetically the moment the members of the pairing have become conscious together and distinct. So recall Levinas's own intentional transgression. Husserl seems to mean that the intentional consciousness, which through the ray of its attention slowly builds up the profiles of an object on the basis of the object's self-donation, this intentional consciousness can somehow be transgressed. Little may happen to the equality of consciousness to itself in this transgression. But when the other is there looking at me, an associative fusion or pairing happens called reciprocal awakening. Maybe I even lose myself as the ego pole of identifications in this face-to-face -face when the spaces around our two bodies merges. I'm speculating, but the proliferation of modes of passivity, the emphases on types of association, the near physical pairing that goes along with Einfühlung not to mention the presence of affective intensities running all along the chain of retentions and protensions. All this gives, the, gives us the Husserl, who I think influenced Levinas. From translating the fifth Cartesian meditation, Levinas was aware of Husserl's 1920s depths of empathy, I'm feeling, and even the possibility that affective chaos might not initially enter so clearly and associatively into flowing transcendental consciousness even if a systematizing consciousness did eventually prevail. I can't summarize the article, obviously, here, but the purpose of the essay was to show four ambiguities Levinas took up, remodelized and sometimes radicalized as the hermeneut of suffering investiture. I repeat that the starting points of both men in matters of ethics were different. And from the material I've been able to read, I'm not sure Husserl was all that interested in passions and suffering for as they relate to ethics. But I hope I've discussed, if fast, four areas in which I see in Levinas a Husserlian who opened intersubjective Einfühlung and passivity to their underside, to that inequality with self of consciousness that comes to pass in an instant in intersubjective encounters and in some embodied memories. James. So I'd like to thank Professor Bergen for her paper and for being here, as well as thank the journal for organizing this and, and Simon for, for moderating. Um, I don't have a good joke to start off with. Sorry, I, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm not even wearing a tie. <laughs> I do have some comments. Um, uh, one, one comment is, which I often make, um, sometimes to the relative chagrin of the Husserl scholars that I hang out with, is that I, I've always considered Levinas to be one of the most interesting commentators on Husserl that one can find in the literature. His early essays, so for example, the 1940 summary presentation of Husserl's work, titled simply the work of Edmund Husserl, still stand today as fair and comprehensive assessments of Husserl's thought. This is remarkable given that they are based on a small fraction of Husserl's total extant writings. 
I've always credited this achievement of Levinas's to a rare combination of insight, philosophical imagination, and charity. But after reading and now listening to Professor Virgo, I'm convinced that one should take seriously the idea of Levinas's philosophy as, at least in part, Yeah. Oh, it's my, sorry. <laughs> Sudden corporeal interruption. Um, so where was I? Yeah, so we should take seriously the idea of Levinas' philosophy as, at least in part, a fundamental transformation of the Husserlian project. Now, it's a very difficult thing to bring the whole of this project into view, not to mention assessing the influence it did or could have had on an equally complex thinker like Levinas. I think Professor Burgo achieves a great deal on both fronts, and I will again allude to her essay, which provides such a rich trove of suggestions and insights that the footnotes alone will keep you in the library for a month. So since I can't hope to comment in any systematic way in either the talk or the article, I will offer instead a few observations to supplement Professor Burgo's presentation, highlighting some points she has already made, as well as adding a couple of my own. So first, it strikes me that the central issue is the meaning of intentionality. Levinas often emphasizes an important consequence of Husserl's idea of intentionality, which one might call the escape from the prejudice of logic, or the tendency to insist that truth and understanding occur only in judgments as the ultimate arbiters of meaning. Intentionality promises an escape from this prejudice and that it inscribes the accomplishments of judgment into a broader field of the lived experiences of meaning. But the theme of intentionality also sets the stage for some perplexity. And perhaps here we have another of Professor Burgo's ambiguities in Husserl's thought that became so fruitful for living us. Namely, intentionality would also seem to exclude any kind of sensualism. If consciousness is intentional, then it must always already be a relating to things and never a mere passive interiority. Nevertheless, and much to the dismay of many of his interpreters, was remained remain faithful to the end to the idea that sensation plays a central role in any phenomenological account of perception or consciousness in general. And precisely, sensation is a non-intentional dimension of that experience. On Levinas's reading, Husserl's thought provides a consistent emphasis on what we might call the universal in impressionality of intentional life. Descriptions of this impressionality pr prove time and again to be essential for Husserl's understanding of the being of intentionality. Above all, when we move from the earlier act analyses of the logical investigations to the transcendental philosophy proper of ideas more and later. If anything, for Levinas, this commitment to sensibility saves Husserlian phenomenology from some of his worst impulses. For in any transcendental philosophy, there is a tendency towards formalism, towards the, towards the delimitation of abstract structures that govern the unfolding of experience at the expense of a reflection on its concreteness. In the case of a transcendental phenomenology, one might say, this tendency expresses itself as a structuralism all too absorbed by the forms of intentional interweaving in a matter that threatens to obscure the original commitment to the concrete that was so important to phenomenology as an alternative to neo-Kantianism. So experience, taken as a robust expression of this concreteness, would be an alien theme when elaborating the transcendental field if it were not recognized that this field is intrinsically an impressional nexus, that intentionality has its ultimate source, um, has as its ultimate source the unique individual life of living sensation. Above all, Husserl's theory of sensation plays its most prominent and important role in the analyses of internal time consciousness. That is, the time that belongs to consciousness itself, or that simply is consciousness. The question of sensibility in Husserl here becomes a double question, one of sensation and time. Accordingly, the focal point of Levinas's reading in texts such as intentionality and sensation is just this double question. Sensation plays a prominent role in the analysis of time because the basic problem of time is one of distance, the consciousness of the distance between the present and the past, between the future and the now. These distinctions are at bottom non-conceptual. There's no mark that would allow us to judge a moment in its determinateness as something past, yet nor is the distinction unambiguously intentional in character. The phenomenality of the past with that of time is such 
involves a distance that is not marked out with clear signposts that organize the field of intentional manifestation or appearance. Rather, the no more of the past and the not yet of the future represent an integrated presence of the non-present in the whole of intentional life itself and are not something projected out before or behind it. Thus, thus Rosewell's idea of an inner time, a time that belongs to intentional life, which presences its imminence and which is not the terminus of an objectifying act of consciousness. Levinas also emphasizes in the essay Intentionality and Sensation one of the most important themes in Husserl's analysis of time, that of modification. The consciousness of time, the living of its passage, is described by Husserl in terms of a distance between the unmodified originary impression and the retentional, protentional phase modifications that constitute lived intentional consciousness as a concrete impressional flow. Presence of the just now in the now is guaranteed, and with that its position in the flow of consciousness is determined by a modification of its now character that inscribes it as a present not now in the living present. Retentional modification in this way does not thereby erase the distance between the then of the just now and the immediacy of the now, as if the past were only known through its becoming again present, but enfolds it and refigures it into the profile of a passage of interpenetrating moments or phases. The past, or inner time as a whole, is thus not an object, an intentional content, but a sensuous temporalization that belongs to the living present, to the life of intentional being itself. This is the core of Husserl's centralism, the insight that time is an impressional continuity that does not negate or traverse the distance between the past and the future, but instead lives it, is this distance in the form of an originary sensuousness. Despite all the idealizing tendencies one finds in Husserl's account of the life of intentionality, its source, its origin, is in an original, unmodified, non-ideal passivity, one that remains fundamentally unpredictable and unanticipated. Intentional life is thus an impressional being penetrated, and with that a self-creation out of what is wholly other than itself. If intentionality is a being directed towards, it is so only from out of this temporal sensuous upsurge of creative being, a spontaneous sensation that takes the shape and form of a continuum of self-modifications. So to quote Levinas from Intentionality and Sensation, proto-impression is non-ideality par excellence. The unforeseeable novelty of contents that arise in the source of all consciousness and being is original creation, a passage from nothingness to being to a being that will be modified in being for consciousness, but that will never be lost. A creation that deserves the name of absolute activity, of genesis spontaneum. But it is at the same time fulfilled beyond all conjecture, all expectation, all germination, and all continuity, and consequently is holy passivity, receptivity of the other penetrating the same, life and not thought. What is most striking about Levinas's reading is his argument that Husserl's notion of close quote. Too excited. <laughs> what is most striking about Levinas's reading is his argument that Husserl's notion of impersonality of the sensible does not disrupt the integrity of a transcendentally reduced consciousness. The transcendental field is an original flow of experience, a first intentionality dispersed in time one that inaugurates precisely the sense in which intentional life is present to itself across that first distance of unmodified, modified time. Again, Levinas, from the same essay I've been quoting, to quote, through his theory of the sensible, Husserl restores to the impressional event its transcendental function. In its mass that fills time, he discovers a first intentional thought that is time itself, presence to self across the first divergence an intention in the first lapse of time and the first dispersion. He perceives a corporeity in the depths of sensation that is a liberation of the subject vis-a-vis -vis the very petrification of the subject, a gate, a freedom that demolishes structure. Levinas's defense, close quotes, Levinas's defense of Husserl's conception of sensibility is significant, above all since it points to the manner in which he approaches the whole question of just what it is that the phenomenological reduction is and is not sensitive to. Levinas is, of course, not uncritical of Husserl's idealism. 
and the phenomenological reduction in particular, but his critique is nuanced in interesting ways. Above all, for Levinas, the justification of the reduction in Husserl's thought does not ultimately rest on assertions of the apodicity of imminence. Again, to quote Levinas, this time from the ruin of representation. Quote, the phenomenological reduction has never seemed to me to justify itself by the apodicity of the imminent sphere, but by the opening of the play of intentionality, by renouncing the fixed object that is the simple result of and, 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 and the dissimulation of this play. Intentionality means that all consciousness is consciousness of something, but above all, that every object calls forth and as it were gives rise to the consciousness through which its being shines and in doing so appears." Close. Nevertheless, the reduction for Levinas does betray a distinct intellectualism, one that threatens to undermine the description of this play of intentionality. Take as a case in point Levinas's comments on the phenomenological analysis of bodily comportment in the 1959 essay, Intentionality in Metaphysics. Here Levinas takes up the contrast in Husserl between the pure ego of the reduction and the incarnate bodily ego of the Ishkan, commenting on a passage from Husserl's 1934 manuscript on the constitution of space that had been published by Alfred Schutz in 1940. The passage in question from Husserl runs, quote, ego in the ego attitude, ich in a ich einstein. I grasp myself in my corporeity as moving myself. I grasp myself in the kinesthetic function as the basis of something. Levinas then asks, Quote, Yet are we entitled to ask how, in the final analysis, Husserl understands the way in which the ego grasps itself as? Is this grasping a purely theoretical act of a disincarnate being? In the obsession of the reduction in this unsurmountable temptation to seek the intention of a pure ego behind the intentionality of, our, of incarnation, I think what is at stake is a positive possibility, constitutive of kinesthesis, of the memory of its origin and interiority. Close quote. In this way, Levinas again takes us to the theme of freedom, of the idea of intentionality as the self-encounter of a light in which the world becomes manifest. To be sure, Husserl's conception of the phenomenological reduction is for Levinas ultimately determined by the more general thesis of an irreducible privilege of theory, but is also one that responds to a fundamental call that retains its legitimacy even after we have managed to shed the theoretical prejudice. What is at stake in theory is not mastery alone, but the possibility of responding to a call for what Levinas describes as the, quote, recovery of the self from the history and the world in which the ego is engaged, close quote. Thus to reflect on any structure of intentional life, sensation, time, kinesthesis, perception, is to encounter one aspect of this field of, of existence in light of this call for self-recovery. Another way to put this is to say that intentionality is, is originally a naivete that demands from itself to be clarified, to be recovered, and is this demand that lies at the positive core of the idea of the reduction. This also means that the reduction points towards the development of a particular form of attitude for life. To be sure, the reduction can only be understood as a method, but that does not have to mean that it is merely an instrument. In Husserl, the reduction is in no way a technique for generating certainties. It draws its meaning only from a life that has learned to become oriented towards itself in the posture of free being or a self that recovers itself in its dignity as a mind. Reflecting on these readings of Husserl, coupled with Professor Berger's illumination of the reimagining of Husserlian themes in Levinas' thought, leads one to the following question. To what extent do Levinas's contributions to contemporary philosophy occur not only thanks to, but also in spite of, his commitment to salient aspects of Husserl's phenomenology? The story Professor Berger is beginning to piece together is far more complicated than one of Levinas separating the wheat from the chaff in Husserl's thought. It is instead one of an almost seamless duality of appropriation and repudiation. One clue for how we might think of this can be found in the final section of Levinas' essay, The Ruin of Representation. Levinas ends this text with a brief reflection on the potential consequences for philosophy that result from an exploration of the implicit horizons of sense, precisely when these horizons have shown themselves not simply to be incomplete representations, but depths that belong to the being of the representing subject itself. 
This, Levinas suggests, opens the way for a phenomenological reflection on a, quote, life that bestows meaning, that may reveal itself otherwise, and presuppose for its revelation relations between the same and the other that are no longer objectification, but society, close quote. This potential, in effect, announces the ruin, the final ruin of representation, the fact that in phenomenology, the continued reliance on ever more broadened notions of objectification, so characteristic of Husserl's thought, ultimately falls short of the full scope of the theme of intentionality. Horizon's sense bestowal quickly exceeds the claims of a dominant sovereign ego and the basic gesture of an ethics, the primal fact of the impossibility of the complete absorption of the other into the same, becomes possible on, a, on distinctively phenomenological grounds. And here I quote Levinas from that essay. Where all Zingebu was the work of a sovereign ego, the other could in fact only be absorbed in representation. But in a phenomenology where the activity of totalizing and totalitarian representation is already exceeded in its own intention, where representation already finds itself placed within horizons that it somehow had not willed, but with which it cannot dispense, an ethical Zin Gable becomes possible. That is, a Zin Gable essentially respectful of the other. And Husserl himself, in the constitution of intersubjectivity, undertaken on the, base, on the basis of objectifying acts, social relations, irreducible to the, to the objectifying constitution that meant to cradle them in its rhythm, are abruptly awakened. This already points the way to Levinas's own unique path. But his journey continued to be influenced and inspired by Husserl's phenomenology, a philosophy in which the sometimes self-absorbed dignity of the mind did not fully close, close itself off from a sensitivity to the ethical. We want to understand better this latent openness of Husserl's reflections on intersubjectivity to the Levinasian problem of ethical life, I could make no better recommendation than to read Professor Bergman's essay. Thank you. You agree, basically. Yeah, so let's, let's go have a beer. <laughs> uh, but you get the right to reply, but you know, I think, okay, if you'd right. like to, if you'd like to um, reply. Sure. I mean, I, firstly, I, I don't have, I do have my Sensualism and postural is an interesting thing because Sensualism seems to mean simultaneously sensibility, what the French call sensibility, meaning emotions, and feelings like the hardness of the table or the coldness of the air. And I wonder, does that matter? Um, I have no argument with Husserl, but I do remember and what I find interesting, and I wonder if this changed, is when you hold them in parallelism, then emotions get sort of pulled in the direction of the objective of the objectivity of the contents of you know the hard table, etc. So it's something that a French commentator named Lavigne points out of the young Husserl sort of working on an ethics, which turns into a rather intellectualist affair. And I'm wondering, I suspect you know this. Does this change? I mean, with the with the Einführung discoveries and the radicalization of that, is Levinas carrying on a kind of pipe dream, an ethical Zingebung, respectful of the other? Is there that in Husserl, or are we always in that beautiful rationalistic ethics that we find in the Kaizo essays, you know? And maybe that's the best. Yes. <laughs> so, so like I said, it, it's difficult to bring the entire project easily into view. Right? So, um, um, so on the one hand, you can say, um, uh, so it's you know, Husserl does want to go in these various directions and, and take seriously as philosophical problem. Um, feeling, emotion, make distinctions between, let's say, 
um, the notions of you know, the way in which sensation is involved in, let's say, the aesthetic dimension of perception versus um, a, a whole varieties of classes of different kinds of feelings. He's already doing this in the logical investigations. He's actually quite influenced by someone like Brentano in this respect, who wants to even go further than Brentano and basically wants to understand emotive experiences um, as, as having their, their own um, manner of, let's say, presentational heft without being dependent upon intellectual functions in order to, in order to make them, as it were, unities of meaning or meaningful or intentional as such. Right? So it isn't just because of a, of, a, of, of, a, of a kind of judgment that I make that a feeling has some kind of presence for me or some kind of importance or can be marked in some way. It has its own, right? Own manner of organizing the world around it. Well, so also there's there's um, there's a huge project that he begins um, just after the First World War and it continues up until the 1930s, and it's called the Structures of Consciousness. These structures of little science, and it's, it's currently being it's like the last big publication that's going to come out of it. And there, there's an entire theory of drives, which yeah. are remarkably com you know comparable to Freud. Well, and engages it on a very fundamental, even a notion of a drive intentionality. So you've been thinking of, so if you have a notion well, that... Yeah, Bernard's been doing that. Bernard's been doing work yeah. on that, right? And, and that's, I mean, that's, I've, I've worked with some of these manuscripts, they're fascinating. And they, so, so you can, as you can always do in Husserl, there's, there's in the mountain of manuscripts, tens of thousands of pages of, you know, the fellow wrote constantly. You can always say there's exceptions, right? But it, in a way, it's not relevant because, on the other hand, Husserl, is, if you look at the ethical writings, this is, and the Kaiser articles are a part of this, right? His ethical writings from the 20s in particular. Um, even his engagement with Fichte during the First World War in, in a series of lectures that he gave. It's clear that the, the primacy of, what I call it the dignity of the mind, right? The primacy of, 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 of the theoretical is actually meant to be the cornerstone of a certain conception of ethical life. And the kind of, so for Husserl, what's fundamentally important is to be able to, on the one hand, recognize our capacity to assess the whole of our lives and to determine it in a rational direction, right, in terms of the adoption of a very Kantian sense of a set of principles that guide us. And he's committed to that. He's committed to the primacy of theoretical life is actually shaping who and what we are as a society, as an individual, what it may be. But it isn't just done out of prejudice. He has, he has an argument for it. It isn't done out of because he ignores these other depth problems of drives and sensation and feeling and emotion. On the contrary, he wants to incorporate them into his overall account, but where there's going to be, and Levinas knew this very well, a primacy of, of, of theory, of the theoretical posture. So that's... that's Said nothing. Yes, you have. I think that's wonderful. I just wonder, after World War II, what one can do. Because there's a tragedy. I'll shut up. Yeah. I've spoken way too much. But there is a fundamental tragedy in that way of founding, I think, ethics, belied by what happened afterwards, belied by the way in which reason was misused. Yeah instrumental reason is misused. Anyway, this is this is one of the things I'm wrestling with. It's time for you but to the speak. The opposite is true, right? Because, I mean, the opposite is true in the sense that you'd be, I mean, if you read the doc Levinas' doctoral thesis on Husserl, right, the critique of Husserl, there are a few main lines of critique, but one is there's an absence of historical historicity in Husserl. And then, but the main charge is the charge of intellectualism. Right? Intellectualism primacy of theory. Now, what you've both um, established uh, in Bettina, you know, in, in, in great detail, is the, um, the complexity of that, when, when James talks about an almost seamless duality of appropriation and repudiation, right? and this, in particular, this focus on <coughs> non-ideal passivity um, life, let's say. Right? And, um, and Levinas in 
it's it's really weird. It's really weird. Levinas seen otherwise than B. You're right. And he he picks up uh, these Husserlian themes, um, and that then became becomes his accounts of of the self, the recurrence of the self. I mean, what you're saying is absolutely accurate. But the the flip side of uh, I mean, going back to the doctoral thesis, the doctoral thesis is that Husserl is great. <laughs> But there's a primacy of theory, intellectualism. And that's why Heidegger's right. Okay? And Heidegger's major insight for Levinas is and remains to the end facticity. Okay? The primacy of facticity. So therefore, the philosophical project, as conceived from the Greeks to Vassal, is fine. <coughs> but it lives under the primacy of theory, right? And what Heidegger does is to shift that towards factical life. Yeah. That factical life ends up being, as it were, the philosophy of Hitlerism yeah, in 1934. <laughs> in parenthesis, it's that kind of, you know, so I don't know how, it, it, gets, even, it gets even muddier. But the, um, well, I don't want to complicate things, but the, I mean, the, the kind of, I mean, the, the, the third wheel of this, whatever, dance is, is Heidegger. Um, and the, you know, it's as if when Bettina is explaining Levinas's complex, seamless, you know, repudiation and appropriation of Husserl, what he's finding in Husserl is what he was reading as Heidegger's critique of Husserl in the, in the late 20s, through being in time, but somehow thickened out um, in the analysis that Hassan gives. Mm. And uh, which then leads you to the, to the view that what's the difference between passive synthesis and facticity? Well, you know, how would we carve that question up? I don't know. But it seems that the Levinas is, I mean, and the, then, the, then the question is, I mean, the, 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 the meta meta question is whether Levinas is right in this intuition. His intuition is that facticity or this account of passive synthesis that Bettina's pulled out gives us an account of itself. And we can call that ethic in some way. Yeah, that's, right. that's one view of ethics. Husserl has another view of ethics, which is committed to primacy of theories and certain rationalism. Yeah. Now, which view of ethics but is the right view of ethics? But, but not necessarily theory. allergic to facticity. Mm -hmm. Depends on how you understand that. Yeah, and even on. in the context of being in time, to take that as a it's definitely an argument against a certain prejudice of theoretical. But that's in a way also how, how Husserl begins. It's how Brentano is sort of sees himself as a as some kind of alternative to neo-Kantianism. Right? Yeah. Is that it's it's a it's a return to the concreteness, right? Back to the things themselves, right? Back to the, the concreteness things. of of the lived experiences of meaning mm -hmm. as the constitutive source for whatever it is that theory is going to mean. Mm -hmm. That it's not based upon some kind of separation. Right. It's not based upon some kind of, as it were, non-factical, non-concrete, you know, intuitive ability that somehow stands outside of concrete life. Right. Which is what's peculiar about Husserl's conception of transcendental philosophy. Right. It's, it's grounded in not a kind of, of conceptual or theoretical reconstruction of life. It's actually grounded in what he, what he literally calls a transcendental experience, which is like a wooden iron for a Kant or even a Hegel. Right. So one needs to sort of, you know, how, you know, I think Levinas is sensitive to this, is that the, the, what facticity is to be and how it's to be articulated is still at, in play in Yes. Right? In oh, spite yeah. of, as a kind of undercurrent too, that's changing the status of, the, of this, as we're primacy of, of the theoretical. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think actually his, dis I think he, it's not just siding with Heidegger that, that leads him to push against this primacy of the theoretical in Husserl. Mm -hmm. I think there's more to it. I think that's actually contribution he makes is a, is a genuine sort of you know fundamental critique on the Surlian grounds to this primacy. Of, you know, and I don't necessarily think it's just that's his Heidegger moment. I think Heidegger plays a role mm -hmm. in opening Husserl up in that way. But I think it's it's a more complex story. If we're going to talk about the three of them, yeah. Right? Um, but that's it to me. As I say, I think what's wrong with the, um, you know, there's this collection of essays, right? This sort of, you know, discovering existence with Husserl and Heidegger. It's one of the worst titles I've ever 
it's like you know, a road trip with us for Heidegger. You know, it's, 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 you know, we're cruising around and so beat up over Toronto. Remember she kind of uses his, you know, his, his discovery as he comes with Huss, so he leaves the Heidegger there. Yeah, exactly. He's just a lie. But 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 he's very much. But this period, he's very much a commentator on both. And 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 in terms of that, I think if you know if you're interested in reconstructing the what's philosophically at stake in the contrast between us and Heidegger, Levinas, like others of his generation, like Jan Patochka, are very interesting figures to go to in order to attempt to to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not just a commentator. It's a commentator on sort of what what sort of the what needs to happen to classical phenomenology in the wake of the Second World War? Yeah. Um, in the wake of the, the double war that is just the inauguration of the 20th century. That, that's, that's his project. That's what he's doing. And he's transforming it from within, not just siding with Wilson Ryder. He's actually working within both paradigms in fundamental ways in very complicated ways. Yeah. That's very persuasive. Um, Maybe if we open it up, because mm. right. there's plenty to say. Please. I was going to specifically the uh, emphasis on... Hello. Uh, I, um, I was going to comment specifically on the emphasis on face-to-face -face, um, and corporality and sort of the sense, um, and how seeing another's writing um, changes Levinas' conception. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously the difficulty some sense it's more self-conscious, it's a Hegelian sense. Another sense it is um, more difficult to infer the other, and there's more possibility of going wrong without the feedback of um, the constant sensuous feedback of the face-to-face -face encounter. Um, but I wonder, um, considering in a digital age where we are always using telecommunications, uh, and we do get this sort of constant feedback, um, is this textual person um, say, call them the hexadecimal person. Is this wow. sort of different sense of the other than the gaze? For, you know, I'm thinking is a different sense. Hearing, seeing, and now writing is becoming almost, you feel, you know, you have a different feeling using this telecommunication. It's like, is this, is this yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, it's got more dimensions in gesture, maybe. Right. Professor Berger. Oh, God. Well, I'm certainly not. Sold this one out for us. Okay, I do. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, there's not going to be much, much space merging between the message of the other and myself. I mean, you know, when the professor was speaking about the two persons facing each other and the way in which space turns gradually into objective space, because I could go over where you are. I can't go where the message is. So this means that that thing that holds us together has got to be something else than some visual movement that turns the space into objective space. I can't go to the message. And that would suggest that the, the Einfühlung involved could be something really strange. Well, like more ontological, more into the theoretical. It's like Maybe more into the theoretical, but it's a different ontology, isn't it? I mean, Simon, what kind of an ontology is it? What? <laughs> the ontology of the, of the communication of well, the I've got no idea. <laughs> Just turn our phones off. It's probably a ontology. Yeah, it's a, it's a exactly. Ontology. It's a ontology. <laughs> a hexadecimal ontology. Thank you. Yeah. Just sorting that one out. Any, oh, Professor Carr. Thank you very much. Good that you're here. You can well, finally <laughs> shed some light on this, <laughs> this discussion. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, I really appreciate what you're doing here, and uh, you've obviously put a lot of work into this uh, in, in a, it, a, as an attempt to sort of a rapprochement between two figures that yeah. people usually regard as yeah. and, and so on. And, um, you know, I think your strategy is very interesting because you're talking about developments in Husserl, mm -hmm. which living in us may or may not have been aware of. That's right. He knew. I mean, why the rest he knows of passive synthesis. I, it, forgive me for interrupting. He right. does know the passive synthesis yes. notes. That's clear. Really knows those. Yeah. Um, but I, I guess what this kind of picks up on what James said that you know all the parallels that you can discover and talk about seem to me in the end to be overshadowed by the the concept of the primacy 
Um, and I guess what I mean by that is that at least in the period post-1961, um, all of Levinas' concern about intersubjectivity and the public aware are ethical concerns. And um, I don't think that's true of Husserl. I think Husserl is interested in ethics. He try, tries early on, you mentioned it yourself, you know, to talk about ethics, and the subject comes up as he, as he goes along. But I think, uh, on the whole, he regards phenomenology as somehow ethically neutral, except, of course, in the sense of the primacy of the, of the rational, the theoretical. I mean, that's a, that has its own normative structure. It's a very different one from the kind of thing that uh, Levinas is uh, concerned about. So yeah. um, I'm not even sure where Heidegger fits into this, but uh, <coughs> as between Levinas and Husserl, it just seems to me that there's this fundamental difference, and that that difference also um, affects their actual analysis uh, of your subjectivity of the experience and the other things. Um, so I guess I, I just found, in, I read the article too, uh, not as much emphasis on that overarching concern as I would have liked, as a way of understanding really the differences between them more than the similarities. Mm -hmm. Now you see what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would you like a response? Um, to me, when Levinas' concern is ethical, but not in the sense that we take ethical usually to mean. And so to, to me, I read Levinas privileging otherwise than being. But what we're talking about is the recurrence of very disturbing affect. And this is Levinas, I think, trying to say, why are we interested in what happens to another person at all? Why do we care? It's very similar to his problem with God. I mean, people see God in Levinas, and he uses the term, I was just reading about this. But what he's asking is, why do we, what is that kind of signification that we are trying to express when we use a word like that? So ethics and God in both cases are, he's digging under trying to say what is going on emotionally, as we were, affectively, uh, what is not synthesizing such that I later say, well, uh, did that person get hit by a truck, or are they all right? Or, you know, whatever example you want. In other words, the return of something bothers me. Now, that's not ethics in any kind of calculus of no, pleasure, I mean, happiness. But it is different, though, from what... It is different, I, that's a good I agree. Disturbing yeah. affect, is that yeah, the that's exactly right. That's right. I think Husserl is oh, yeah. interested in everyday yeah. experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. 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 Occasional disturbing affects, but yep. it's not all that. Yep. They're all still it. No, nope, I and completely agree. Because of Levinas' focus on that, yeah. Uh, yeah. it gives a, yeah. a cast to the whole yeah. investigation that just makes it different. I completely story. agree. To which I would then ask you in return, when one steps off of a field called phenomenology, because intentionality has grown so broad, that we even have drive intentionality. And as one's, yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> you know, and and the, 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 the phenomenology of non-conscious is letting us a whistle's term. Have you stepped into psychologism? Or have you stepped into hermeneutics? In which case, I'm willing to say that, you know, Divinas has moved into psychologism. To a, to a an orthodox Husserlian, this is no longer phenomenology in the Husserlian sense. And that's all right. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, that's all right, provided one is honest about it. But you're not saying that Levinas does that, are you? I am absolutely. Oh, you are. I am, I am saying that Levinas goes so far with Husserl and then draws a line that Husserl once drew himself, which is, beyond this, I can't constitute the other person. It's done. It's an absolutely that I and then he dramatizes. And that's the hermeneutic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah. I just add one, one bit to it, so we're coming in a different direction. Is, um, so one way to contrast maybe the kind of you know, um, ethical sensitivities of, of either of them, you know, both of them, is between 
is so for 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 Husserl, it's very much this is very clear in the ethical writings. It's always a question of discovering that which is higher in us, which is highest in us, and reshaping and reforming ourselves through a dedication to that highest. And and this you know takes a number of different forms. In some cases, it's even associated with a certain you know notion of the love of God. Right? God is the highest in us. Chooses himself by by you know, himself through us, as it were, in terms of his own, his own self-affirmation. Um, that's very much the sort of the notion, right? So the, the whole notion of renewal that he works out mm -hmm. in the 20s is very much oriented around that, right? And that's, and that's generalized beyond ethical renewal. You can think about the renewal of something like a scientific culture, right? scientific civilization, Europe. Uh, but, you know, Levinas, one way to kind of, just to start the discussion about, that kind of fixes the, just the feel that his ethical sensibility is this is this quote from Dostoevsky, right? That, that everyone is responsible for everyone else. Everyone's guilty for everyone else, and I'm more than everyone. Mm -hmm. Right. So that kind of you know that that being hostage to something that is from out to something that is not the highest. In, it's, it's in a sense, it's it's a total disturbance that comes out of a as he puts it, although otherwise it being a. A, a passivity older than any passivity, right? It's something that there's nothing in me that can even handle it, and it's a certain kind of it's a basic trauma, and so just sort of juxtaposing those two sort of very simple pictures, and they're oversimplifications in both cases. In a sense, they just keep making each image deeper and deeper and deeper, and, deeper and draw themselves further and further apart from one another in a fundamental way. So I think it's. I mean, for love, it's, it's the lowest. It's the lowest. It's the you know the, the, the question is the um, I mean what Bettina's right. What Levinas uh, calls substitution in um, otherwise than being, which is the central concept in otherwise than being, the central <coughs> concept in that book, and the central concept arguably Levinas's work, is this complex adaptation of this insight. Yeah. That he gets from Husserl, and it's a level of you know, the lowest, right? as it were, the, the non-identity of the feeling of aliveness, something like that. Uh, the question then is, which is your question, is whether one can use the adjective ethical to describe this or not. Husserl thinks no. Levinas thinks yes. That's the question, and um, it's an interesting question. Ryan Gustafsson. <coughs> Yeah, thank, thank you for the talk. Um, I took you to be arguing that um, this this richer reading of of, Le of a visceral on empathy and um, could be read as kind of a prefiguration of Levinas's account of the ethical relation. Right? Um, but but in, in otherwise than being, um, Levinas himself sort of resists the language of inner subjectivity and empathy to yeah, characterize. Yeah, you're right. Completely. Oh, yeah. right. The, the ethical relation. Um, yeah. So I'm wondering, how do you account for that resistance or that repudiation of that language? Yes. He seems to think that empathy and inner subjectivity aren't aren't a prefiguration of the ethical relation. Yeah, the ego alter ego relations. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Runs that through the fifth Cartesian metaphor. Yeah. Um, but in addition to that, he's not doing epistemology. He's really not doing epistemology. So he's not going to talk about intersubjective relations in, in the way in which they are constituted, or in terms of the impact that they have on me as a positive consciousness. So that it's, he's already stepped into something somewhat different. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But I, I yeah. Yeah, but, 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 but what, what I'm really trying to get at is that without the intuitions, without the insights of Husserl, I think Levinas would not have been able to move in the directions that he did. Probably without those of Heidegger as well. But the point you made about, uh, no, the point Simon made, I think, anyway, about facticity versus mm. passive synthesis. Mm. Facticity, isn't facticity already the intervention of common um, it, yeah. It, no, uh, no. Okay. No. Okay. I mean, well, yeah. Yeah. there's a circle. <laughs> there's a circle, right? 
You could say if interpretation yeah. is the laying out of facticity, yeah. you know, interpretation is, is the laying out of facticity, yeah. it's, it's a hermeneutic act. But there is, a, there is, as it were, there's something factical yeah. which has to be laid out yeah. and made explicit. Yeah. Is that thing which is factical and not quite laid out, is that hermeneutic? But passive synthesis doesn't require the hermeneutics. That a certain Heideggerian hermeneutics does appear to require. I mean, now we're getting into some tangent. Well, uh, could I just, just, just to, um, so where where it it so the notion of genetic phenomenology in Husserl is comparable to let's say a hermeneutics of facticity in the sense that um, it. It, it, it's, the, it's the depth investigation of a unity of sense or of an experience, let's say, um, which um, is attempting to tease out dimensions of it that are not transparent or immediately available to, to something like a reflection on content. So it's, it's actually another way to think about it that it, it's trying to capture um, a lived experience in, in its emergent quality. And therefore, the descriptions are always meant to be a little bit excessive with respect to what's actually available in, in terms of phenomenological evidence. It's not, however, an sort of an outright hermeneutics of the experience. Then, then it's still meant to be descriptive, but it's meant to give credit to consciousness for not only being able to observe itself in reflection and to describe itself right, through the modification of reflection. Um, or layered descriptions that make up a kind of composite picture of multiplicity of dimensions that lived experience unfolds in. But precisely, they actually have a sense of it's precisely its emerging character. And this is why past synthesis or the theory of association, that, that is the, the core of it, is called by Husserl, and you cite this in the article, the, the higher development of the theory of inner time consciousness. Because the point is that our consciousness of time leads to the possibility of investigating depth phenomena in a way very different from the methodology of the early sociological investigations, act analysis. Right. Now, when, but then when you turn to hermeneutics, it's also time yeah. that is the core hermeneutic structure and device through which we, we develop hermeneutics. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of overlapping going on here that um, they're, they're, they're difficult to tease out. So, you know, so yeah, what's the difference between facticity and passive synthesis? One could say the, the, the it, on one level is the methodological differences between approaching the concreteness of life in, in two different ways, but trying to get at very similar kind of, of, uh, of uh, depths of, of the phenomenon. Yeah, that's, 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 yeah. That's but, but, but I think it matters, sorry, no, go, 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 just, sorry. just because one of the things Living Us likes to try to do is concretized even on, even over and above height. In other words, he wants to bring the body in even more. I don't know if he fails or succeeds. But that means that he's moving from facticity towards something concrete. In other words, he, he seems to take that side of things when it comes to living, when it comes to oh, yeah, you know, but, yeah. nausea, shame, all these things. As you beautifully translate in on escape. That's the, that's the, I mean, that, that would be the essay to really think about the Dolores yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's complicated. Um, please. <clears throat> um, the thing is really to ground Levinas for me is his uh, temporal characterization of death. Um, I think in a way that kind of succeeds in a way that uh, Heidegger and Husserl, although uh, Husserl in a sense I'm not completely familiar with whether or not he achieves it, but at least in the sense of kind of he seems to be successful with it, where the other comes into play, and yeah. it's, it's experience is, death is something that's beyond sensuous experience, yet it is, it's within the sensuous horizon. And I guess the question I have is if what this means for like the being of intentionality, I can, I can point you to something to read. <coughs> okay. um, 
the, the C manuscripts from later. Um, what's fascinating about them, so they're, they're part of this projected plan of a book on time that he never, he never wrote. Um, but they, there's a lot of manuscripts that <coughs> focus on the problems of, um, of, um, of, of birth, death, and sleep, actually, um, in very interesting ways. And what's interesting about them is that they are sort of descriptions that on the level of passosynthesis, uh, sedimentation, all these are important themes in this context. The, the passive givenness of life as being the context within which something like the meaning of birth, and my own being born, which is another event I don't experience, or can recall, likewise my death, but also sleep as a certain sort of you know fading away of the ego, in which somehow there's this sense of the world continuing to progress, and it's in, in all of those sort of fundamental, sort of on the level of the, the, the sensuous flow of life. That, that's where actually intersubjectivity plays a critical role um, in all three cases, in different ways. And so the kind of, if you think of intersubjectivity as structured not only in terms of, and of course it can't be structured only in terms of a, a series of acts of recognition, but it's structured within, as it were, the sensuous you know, flow of time itself. Right? Our consciousness of time is so interwoven in our consciousness of others, and vice versa, that it's at the core of certain fundamental phenomena, like the, our awareness of our own death. So that's so, you know, read, read this in the Thank you. But Levinas wants um, a dimension of intentionality that is beyond death, which is his meditation on the child of fecundity. Uh, that's his, uh, that's, that's the way out, which is another and there's some beautiful passages of aging and temporality and otherwise in the world. Yeah, oh, yeah. quite striking in that you really can't find anything like that. It's really yeah. interesting. In that. The wrinkling of the skin. Yeah, it's becoming. Yeah, Chris, the older I get, the more I turn back some of that. Crustacean. We all kind of turn into prunes. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Flynn, Bernie. Uh, I think Rob's understood the role of, of sensation. But as you know, you know, in, in, the, in, in both the structure of behavior and the phenomenology of perception, Michael Fenty makes a very sustained argument against the existence of sensations. Oh. And in fact, he connects the leap in sensations to certain intellectualist right. dimensions of, of uh, you know, of, of, of what's in philosophy. I mean, does, does that, I mean, what happens if we become, if we, if we problematize the very existence of sensations. The argument is that there's always already structure. There's always, there, there, it, there, there's not required the spontaneity of consciousness to move from what he says, a, a wandering troop of sensations into a, to an object. That's a great question. I don't, I, I don't think letting us is that interested in sensation per se. No. I don't think he's interested in a sensualism so much as he's interested in in affects. Uh, now, affects are defined by Husserl as that which attracts the attention of the ego. Le sentier, is what he's saying. Yeah, right? le sentier. But le sentier, le sentier, what a mess! What a mess of a word that is because that's mm -hmm. du sentier. Yeah. But also that's sentier. Mm -hmm. So that you get this. That's where part of the confusion, I think, comes up, that the emotionally felt and the sensuously felt are so close here that we lose the sense that I'm sure Levinas was fully aware that there's an abstractionism operative in approaches to sen sensation, you know, in, in the form that well, some analytic folks, uh, or some, some scientific psychologists were carrying. But it's a beautiful question. He's right. It's a great presentation. This is uh, wonderful. But uh, I kind of fall on Professor Carr's point and Ryan's point. Could you push out some of these differences and maybe help me understand the relation between them? But um, in particular, in the Cartesian meditations, there seems to be three aspects of Husserl's account of intersubjectivity. They're absent in Levinas. So one would be home world, alien world. And I wonder, the home world, alien world? Oh, OK. Yeah. And the second one would be this idea that objectivity is grounded in intersubjectivity. And I think this connects up with uh, the idea of rationality and ethics, especially in the crisis. And so I think that might be 
some of the issues of the intellectualism. And, and then the third one would be the relationship between the league and the uh, corporate. Yep. And the fact that uh, Levinas then resituates that relationship in the face as opposed to the body. And, um, but the Leib or the Kirche? Well, well, he seems to deny the Leib, but both in the sense that it becomes so focal on the face. And I wonder, so these are just questions. Yeah. What is a face for Levinas? Right. What, is it? what is a face? It's not something you see. It's connected to a body, too. It's not floating in space. You know? Face is linguistic. Yeah. Face is a term of language, as he always says. And then he drops by that time, otherwise than being there. Sure. But he is talking about the face kind of is gone. What about body? Would the body then be incorporated into the face in that respect? Or? The Which body becomes. I've got my views about you. It's your. You, 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 you go with it, because I'll, I'll just stop. Body. The body is, is the site of things occurring to it, among other things. As Simon was saying before, you know, the body is that which starts to, to crispate mm. and age. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, your question is, is, is terrible because you should be asking James Dodd about the crisis, but, but, but not being quite so glib. The fact of the matter is, by, by otherwise than being, you've got a philosophy in which the production of signification language is so close to the notion of a lived body yep. that it becomes really, really difficult. I mean, you're in a kind of wild hermeneutics deeply influenced by Derrida, as Simon knows, where you can't, you couldn't parse out, you know, Leib as the lived body in Husserl, Körper as, a, as an objectified body. We're on a different terrain at that point. It would take a lot of work to answer that. Thank you for the substantive talk I learned about. Uh, my question. Um, A little louder. Yes, I try. Um, my question is this: As I have learned, maybe mistakenly, correct me, uh, that the notion of intentionality in Levinas is is a broader notion compared to Husserl on the one hand. But on the other hand, uh, besides this broadening of the notion of intentionality, I mean a non-cognitive ethical intentionality in Um On the other hand, I was wondering that, um, because for me, um, as it is um, laid out in the fifth Cartesian meditations, there is something explicitly stipulated in the fifth part in the meditation, and that is uh, for any way to, to have any access to others, you have anything like inner subjectivity, you have to begin from the sphere of oneness. Mm -hmm. And find a way to constitute the otherness of the other. Is there, is there any way still uh, yet in Levinas to constitute the other mm -hmm. and not lose the genuineness the, um, of the other? <coughs> because the intentionality. Answer is, the, the answer is? No. <laughs> you, you want me to answer this? Answer you have a different idea. Okay. Can you have a broad notion all right, of constitution? All right, all right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I, we, we read in Living Us in 61 and then in 74, this movement from an affective, it's not even an intentionality, it's a pre-intentional affection of which I nevertheless become conscious. And the moment I become conscious of it, I suspect we're in what he calls the third part. Mm -hmm. Becoming conscious of it suggests that the flow of time, that he has this vision of these diachronies, where the, the flow of time, sedimenting and protending, every now and then gets interrupted. What, what Levinas cannot answer is how it's conceivable that something like this could be interrupted and then pick up again. Would you need a third element explaining how the two differences, diachrony and synchrony, 
somehow can twist together and yet at the same time remain distinct. And that is, I think, a major, in my view, that's a major, major problem. Because that means that the third party and the other never quite meet. And just to say that the other, that the, that the, that the other, what is it, third looks at the other, looks at me through the eyes of the third party. In other words, I see that humanity on a certain level in that third party. You know, I say, this is Simon Critchley, I know who he is, blah, blah, blah. Good. And I, I, I find that moving. But if one wants to be an epistemologist about that, I don't see a way of explaining the how of the articulation. Maybe you have another answer. Can I just one just yeah, just, yeah. To, just to I mean I've already seen I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing that. It's a these others just sit back. Um, yeah, I mean what, what interests me in, about Levinas as, in, 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 as a contrast to Rousseau is that seem to me, so with, with, with Husserl you have sort of the picture of intersubjectivity I think that emerges is really a, a, a complex field of, of partial constitutions that never really have any kind of finality. So in a way, it's a kind of an insight is that to a great extent, you know, when, when dealing with one another, living in a world where we rely, even to have something like a rule for us, where we rely on something like intersubjectivity. So when he kind of gets at, he tries to get at this weird, weird language about monads and, and, and all this kind of stuff, but a lot of it is really just working around what remains perpetually opaque, but nevertheless significant with respect to what we are vis-a-vis -vis each other as other than one another. And, and sort of the, the, the gesture is that um, there's enough of, a, of a, um, an openness to non-finality, to differentiation, to otherness, that that doesn't really disrupt the transcendental field as something that has a certain basic integrity. Right? Um, and it seems to me that in Levinas, the picture is entirely different, is that field is fundamentally traumatized. Yeah. And it's through that trauma that, um, that uh, the, the, the whole relation to the other has its origin. And it's precisely a radically non-constituted origin. So it isn't just partial. It's actually, you know, it begins as a tear, as a wound, right? This bread being torn from my mouth is a constant metaphor through otherwise being. And it seems to me there's another um, sort of analog that, in, in an odd way, Hegel is closer to Levinas in the master-slave dialect yeah. than he is to Husserl. Because yeah. with Hegel, one thing that's sort of that's part of that, that those sections that I didn't sort of get into the paper is that Hegel makes it very clear that sort of the kind of freedom as a as a whole, a life, right, that this sort of primitive self-consciousness represents. It's, it's described as willing to risk itself, yeah, right. right? Fundamentally risk everything. And therefore, the encounter is a struggle. And the reason why it's a struggle is because the negation of the other, we put everything we are into that negation. So there's a kind of constitutive violence that's basic to sociality, that's basic to subjectivity for Hegel. And in a way, that's exactly what's happening in Levinas, is that the violence doesn't come from freedom or from the other. The violence comes from this other passivity, right? This other sort of relation to that which makes me a hostage. Yeah. And so it seems to me that that's a those are you know, in, in the fun, is that the question of that you know you have a constitution of the other in in Husserl that's perfect and complete and intellectualized and conceptual and, and fully determinate, whereas in Levinas you have this openness. No, there are two different conceptions of openness. One is the openness of a trauma or a wound, an open wound, and the other is the openness of a kind of indeterminacy that nevertheless there's enough of a depth of experience and a depth of consciousness essentially to remain indifferent to. It doesn't disturb me in a fundamental way that I can't, as it were, fix in, in, a, in a totally determinate fashion the consciousness of another that I experience. For us, it's not the problem. What's more interesting is everything that comes out of that in terms of possible forms of sociality. And the notion of, of Heimwelt versus Fremwelt is exactly an instance of that. It's one structural possibility for differing, differing species of, of the, the partially constituted other, let's say, as different types of manifestation of intersubjectivity.
Last question, PJ. We're over time. Go on, take it. Do it. Go on. <laughs> so there's there's two things. Like one is this idea. So this intersubjectivity thing. I wonder if we ought not uh, ask this question about the kind of religiosity that underlies Lebanon's work and the substitution. And, this, and there's this kind of. Uh, I say this because people who take up the Einfühlung and the kind of edible stuff, concurrent with whom sort of like. Edenstein and uh, Gerda Walter, who are doing similar projects, seem to they terminate in a different way, very Christian. Right? The idea that this kind of high rationality and this kind of inner subjectivity fits in a way which it doesn't, doesn't uh, like Levinas can't get down with because he's not Christian. So there's like that. There's that one part, and there's another sense in which what you said earlier about this kind of trauma or like after the war, mm -hmm. and I wonder if like there's a certain kind of uh, inability to even ask a question. Uh, and we should look, because of, of where Bussar lies on the kind of historical plane in this respect, right? And if we can go with people who are picking up on this project, like Patochka, right, who were living after the war, who are interested in these things, and it's not quite politics, it's not quite ethics, but it's this kind of rock, you know, and risk taken, and <clears throat> or even, I would say, some ways to read a rent, um, or even, you know, somebody like, so, like, I don't know, there's part of me to say, like, maybe what this shows is, the ability to sort of break away from the, from three people, whose names we repeat over and over again, and sort of extend the kind of phenomenological. If this is about phenomenology, is this about phenomenology or is it about Husserl and Levinas? Is it about phenomenology and ethics or is it about, you know, you know people? So not sort of as a kind of critique, but maybe there are other avenues to pursue these questions in a way that breaks through, gets unavailable by putting two figures together. But there's still a body of work out there. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but so. mm. well, these are two separate things. Uh, I, I would venture to say without gratuity that that's been basically the, the quest of your career. Oh, but, flattery. <laughs> yes, no, all right. Great. <laughs> because you know, somewhere in your life, I great. think you're a pretty good person. Um, <laughs> but the, the point is, when you were speaking, <laughs> when you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, what, what's the question after the war? What is the question after the war? What is left? Right. And so, and then, of course, the answer is very little, almost nothing. And I'm not trying to be funny, but I, I have the feeling that this is something that you've been looking into. I, I do the sort of scholastic homework, and he does the existential. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, 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 yeah, well, yes, thank you, yeah, yeah, so. Um, yeah, the relationship between, I've I got mean, nothing really sensible to say, so maybe I'll just say nothing. The, I mean, it, it just strikes me that the, uh, the relationship between historical events and philosophy, let's just say that. There's a question to discuss, and James has <laughs> talked eloquently about you know, the First World War, there'd be no, what we're studying, what we've been talking about today without the First World War, the impetus of the Second World War, and all of that, I mean, it is, it's profound and deep. And uh, the shift it has on Levinas, we know, is, is, is cataclysmic. I mean, his, um, I think what's always good to appreciate about Levinas is that Levinas, <clears throat> uh, Levinas was a philosopher, or someone, he was a, you know, an administrator in a Jewish high school in Paris, that was, that was the day job. Um, you know, a specialist in phenomenology, at least that was the only way he was known, it was unknown otherwise. And uh, the belief is that philosophy understood as phenomenology, understood as intentional analysis, is going to be able to elicit structures um, which are going to be able to respond to the historical experience of the Second World War. Uh, that's his naivety, okay? which is a terrific, wonderful naivety. It's not the only naivety he has. I mean, you, I mean, uh, Bettina mentioned a couple of times, a couple of times, the idea of drama, and the, the you know, Levinas is a, a dramatic writer, and um, and if you judge Levinas's work by the standards of Anglo-American philosophy, it's it's rubbish, right? which either means it's rubbish, or which is entirely possible, or there's something wrong with Anglo-American <laughs> philosophy, which I tend to, I tend to, this yeah. is my conclusion. And what Levinas is trying to do through his drama is to try and elicit 
some kind of set of structures uh, which is able to respond to the violence of historical experience. He does that in philosophy, he does that in Talmudic commentaries, as known, but he also does that in the attempt to write a novel. Right? These three drafts of this novel called Eros, that he keeps going back to, and um, which fail in different ways and are fascinating. And it's all about the, if you like, the eroticism, the, the, the sensuality of war. And he's trying to figure, so, so there are all these different avenues in Lebanus, which are attempts to, to meditate that question. And um, I, think what, I think it's important, therefore, to, not to assess Lebanus uniquely by the standards of whether these are good arguments or not, you know, but in terms of the, as it were, the drama of this, this project. And uh, it comes out of something absolutely visceral. Yeah. Lebanus. Well, and, and also the beautiful thing about Lebanus, I think, is that he's not necessarily in control of what he's doing. We always think that a philosopher is someone that must know what they're doing, right? And Lebanus didn't. There's something kind of wild about Lebanus, particularly otherwise than being. The prose is going to places, things are popping up, and you, you feel that this is not, it doesn't necessarily add up. And you can say, well, that's on the one hand, that's, that's bad philosophy. Or it's something really interesting is happening here. And I tend to think, so this wilder, yeah. dramatic side to Lebanon, I think it's, it speaks to something. Which he's, he's hearing that in Husserl, he finds it. That's, that's where it's coming from. Um, yeah, but with the wild man? Yeah. <laughs> okay. that, that's where he's... The least that, wild philosopher ever. No, but not but with the fear. Yeah, no, but that... The, in the field. Yeah, but no, but what, he's, what he hears in the idea of... Every now she's being shot at. The non, the non, no, this, this idea of the non-ideality of life, or this, this passivity of life, and the structures which he elicits from that, which are sleep and death and birth, is that philosophy can do, can engage with those things. That's what that is. Here is a finally a method, of phenomenology, which can can be can can be attentive to life as it is lived. That's the belief in phenomenology. I think that's and and and. and. As a result, and there's two thoughts maybe, as a result, as many of his generation, he did not end up dead or in the Seine. Uh, but I think for, for the phenomenology, I mean, there's a thing that came out, the Husserliana, Husserl material, the Huan Mats, right? The most recent one came out. And some of the stuff that you find in the C manuscripts are there as well, where he, he describes uh, intentionality in prayer. It's no object. So if intentionality is aboutness, if, if intentionality should be defined as consciousness of something, human mind mm -hmm. does appreciate it. This is not about anything. So there is a wildness, I'd like to say, it doesn't come out a lot, in Husserl. And, you know, when he defines uh. religion. Anyway, intentionality gets very stretched, and there's a lot of yeah. space for intentionality. And I have to say, I don't really know what it becomes. On that bombshell, and uh, we're going to move to uh, the next part of the evening, which will be bad beer and good wine. Um, choose your poison. But um, I'd like to thank Alexis for setting this up, and the, the Graduate Faculty Foster Journal. Thank you.